Welcome to Moments with Marianne. This is your host, Marianne Pastana, and we're here today with special guest, Dr. Kristen Lee, who's here to share with us her new book, Worth the Risk, How to Microdose Bravery to Grow Resilience, Connect More, and Offer Yourself to the World. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Kristen Lee. Thank you, Marianne. It's great to be here. What an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this book. What inspired you to write this? Well, thank you again for having me and for the opportunity to share the backstory. So obviously right now we're all marinating in a lot of trauma. A lot has transpired and many of us have been gripped with a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation about what it means to kind of come back into life and face our fears and and face what must be faced. So I actually wrote the book throughout the pandemic and, you know, just like all of us have been both simultaneously heartbroken and heartened um, as we look at humanity. You know, on one hand, we could see uh, the level of devastation and the level of carnage and, and the level of acute suffering. And then on the other hand, I think we see many opportunities for us to kind of come back to our values and, and what's the most important in life and what it means to live a life of meaning. And so I think that, you know, all of those themes are woven through um, helping us to reimagine what risks are worth taking and what we can do on a daily basis to microdose bravery. Well, you hear a lot of people talking about resilience. Are there different meanings to that or is there just one universal term? Indeed, there are a lot of meanings to it. And and by the way, that's one of my favorite things to talk about are the myths of resilience, because historically it's been pitched in ways that make it sound like if we don't have bootstraps and we're not sucking it up and never let anyone see us sweat, that we're a hot mess or we're a failure. And that's really kind of what I might think of as like a 1950s definition of resilience, that old school, you know, just grit your teeth through it. What modern brain science is showing is that resilience is a process. It's not a trait that we're either born with or we're not. And I think that gives us a lot of encouragement because we oftentimes don't feel like resilience is within reach during difficult times, during complexity. And yet the research and the brain science of today shows us that it's a process that we can all work towards through specific habits, mindsets, and behaviors. Well, I think that's very encouraging to hear that because it gives people a roadmap on where we are and how we can get to where we want to be. Indeed. I think that there's a lot at hand. You know, this truly has been a test of a lifetime. There's a a lot of enormity at hand. And I've been fortunate because in addition to my work as a psychotherapist, my research area is on human resilience. And it's something that even for myself as a professional and doing this work, I've really clung to the research and to the data that shows us the ways that we can maneuver through and the ways that we can, you know, come through adversity and come through trauma and still find, a, you know, spaces to heal and, and means of leveraging our strengths and our resources at hand. So you start off your book with the chapter, you're not here to live a what-if life. Is that what you mean by that? Indeed, that's certainly a big component of resilience is looking at what is within our locus of control. And living a what-is life is being able to radically accept what is true. And for all of us, that can often mean very big heartaches and difficult circumstances, and also to look at what is possible and leverage that. And on the, on the converse, if we live a what if life, which is a very proportionate reaction to today's times, we could be stuck in unhelpful mental chatter and cycles. So for example, well, what if the pandemic hadn't happened? Or what if my partner hadn't walked out on me? Or what if, this person hadn't been elected, or what if I hadn't dropped out of school? And we can be very unforgiving of ourselves and one another when we live in a what if space. It's actually defined as counterfactual thinking or hindsight bias. And ultimately, instead, we can shift our attention to what is true, what is possible, and what we can do. 
And a lot of times when we're stuck in a what-if space, I worry that we are ruminating about what has transpired, you know, all the things that have happened, or we're worried, we're steeping or marinating in anticipatory anxiety over what's to come. Well, what if this happens next? Or what if I get sick? Or what if this 17th variant comes out? Or Right? And so living in that what-if space can prevent us from living in the now, you know, being present with both the perils of our lives, but also the beauty as well. And so that's definitely the start of the book. And the key framing is that we do have opportunities to leverage our locus of control and focus on what's possible so that we can be not only more resilient, but better connected with ourselves and one another And then, you know, to be able to contribute positively in the world. Well, you touched on a lot that I want to unpack there. But before we get into Mm -hmm. that, you touched on anxiety. And I know a lot of people Mm -hmm. are suffering with that right now. Do you have your own anxiety story? Indeed, Marianne. That's something that I'm um, very public with. I've gotten very comfortable (laughs) with the uncomfortable, so to speak. So, you know, I've spent years treating it as a therapist and studying it as a researcher, but I'm also a person with a lived experience of anxiety. And I think, you know, when we look at the fact that it's being called the age of anxiety, where one in three of us are experiencing clinically significant symptoms, I know that I'm not alone. And I felt in the positions that I held um, and the influence that I can have in the world, I wanted to be more explicit and more forthcoming on my own follies with anxiety. And you know, what I've discovered is that anxiety is a friend of me, that on one hand, it can torment us. It can be a very difficult circumstance to experience. And then on the other hand, when we look at it as a friend or as, as something that can reveal something important, we can recognize that, let's say, for example, I'm anxious about work that could reveal about me a value, a deeply held value that I want to be conscientious in my contributions in the world, for example. Or let's say I'm very anxious about my children. I worry about their well-being. That reflects that I'm a caring parent. Um, what we see now in, across the world with the data is obviously a level of escalation and a level of common experience. So a way I might put it to you is that I think it can help when we move away from that old school, 1950s, stigmatized mental health condition framing and move to a new way of thinking, which would be human condition. You know, that we all share these experiences of vacillating in and out of reactions to stress, our stressful environment. And I believe that as we can enter into more candid conversations around mental health, and around anxiety, and knowing that many of us are dealing with deep levels of it, that that can help us become more courageous in discovering ways we can ask for help. And I will say that I think, especially for anyone out there like yourself, um, your your work, your legacy, um, people who are either parents or work in, in human fields or healthcare or high achievers, it can be really hard to admit that we're struggling with anxiety. It's easier to show up as the curated versions of ourselves and pretend we're okay or kind of downplay it. But I think it's important that we reveal these things about our human experience because I think that can help us get to a better place together. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, there are times I suffer from anxiety. You know, and and Mm. I think the big thing is, is dealing with it, kind of walking through that because it is a journey. Indeed. I like how you put that. And I appreciate your candor as well. And I think that especially people could see letters after our names or, okay, they have this award-winning podcast or this book. And it's easy for people to get disillusioned by those metrics of outside success. And yet when we look at the research, it's very clear that many of us are suffering in very deep and dramatic ways. Um, And I think the key thing is that oftentimes the biggest lie that anxiety can tell us is that we're the only one. And and to hide it at all costs 
unfortunately, I think we're seeing a lot of change happen with regards to that, less stigma and less discrimination and more open conversations. I think what we need to also do socially is create more access, you know, more space for not only conversation, but more integrated, preventative, and consistent approaches to mental health and well-being. What do you think keeps people afraid of embracing all the different parts of themselves that makes them unique? <laughs> I think there's a lot of social constructs at hand, a lot of pressure to hyper-perform, to please people, to be a perfectionist. I think the metrics of today in a hyper-competitive market are really intense. And there's a lot of messaging about performance and achievement and success that can really truly get in the way of our well-being. And so I think to that end, we have to all unlearn those kinds of notions that are erosive and destructive and instead, you know, embrace our dual narrative sides of our stories that on one hand, we could be doing exceptionally well, we could be on task, we could be showing up with fervor. And then on the other hand, we could also feel very stirred up, very anxious, very much like a hot mess or that, you know, we're one step away from kind of, you know, sort of a meltdown. And all those things, again, are are part of the human experience. It's not a moral failing on our part. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's just part of living life and trying to face what is. I often hear different people I know and friends talk about how they may be a very well-respected speaker and author, but they have a very spiritual side. And there's this fear of bringing that all together as a whole person because there's a a fear that it'll affect one part of their work environment. Mm. Yeah, I think this has been a revolutionary time with regards to that. And I will say, as a person who is very invested in the discoveries of science, I worry like a lot of bickering has kind of gone back and forth between spiritual communities and science. And now I see, luckily, more integration. We're seeing that I don't think people feel they have to be in one box or the other, but we could kind of see that a lot of times we're talking about the same phenomena with different language. And I think those nuances are hard to discover, especially given the brouhaha in society, like the very polarized climate, very binary, all or nothing. And I think um, instead, if we could embrace our multi-layeredness you know, the nuance of these phenomena, the complexity, and just appreciate and look at each other with more reverence and more appreciation for life's multidimensionality, that that could be helpful. But I think when we sort of think we have to fit into kind of like one specific template of living or one way of being or thinking we're going to discredit ourselves if we believe something that might not be as mainstream or that might not be part of the current understanding of the groups we affiliate with, that we could be ostracized. And I think that's something that a lot of people are facing across culture, across the world. They're trying to take agency to to discover their spiritual path and their life path. And sometimes the feedback they get from society or families of origin or communities of origin is not very friendly. You know, it can be pretty harsh. And ultimately, I think in any environment we participate in, the more we can embrace our varied identities and express ourselves and embody this, the healthier it can be. Well, thank you for sharing your uh, your insights on that, because I, I feel it's so important to look at maybe integrating a life. And I know in your book, you you mentioned when you talk about resilience, you're saying that we're wired for it. And I'd love for you to expand on that for our listeners. Indeed, for anyone listening and you're thinking about what you're grappling with and what your resilience levels are, I want you to first know that resilience is a process, as I mentioned already, and we are incredibly adaptive as a species. You know, in society, sometimes we're always down on ourselves or we're looking at the problems and what's wrong and there's a lot of labeling, you know, this person's not smart or they're stupid or, you know, there's all that kind of stuff that goes back and forth. 
I think what we have to also stop and realize is, you know, alternatively stop and realize is that we are, our minds have infinite capacity. And when I say we're wired for resilience, what that means is that we are, you know, because of brain plasticity, because of the way our brains are, we can continually grow and evolve. You know, so for example, if we are struggling, uh, let's say we have a behavior we're trying to change or improve with, and we're struggling with that, it could feel like, you know, we could get down on ourselves about that. Or if we're dealing with a lot of dark and complex emotions, a lot of hardship and trauma, as I said earlier, we could feel like we're not very strong or resilient. But as the species research reveals, just how adaptable we are. And if we give our mind and body and soul the things that it needs to flourish, if we pay attention to the science of human flourishing and of behavior change, we can take those small steps towards change that leads to big impact. And so anyone listening, you know, again, there's a lot coming at us. There's a lot that we're trying to make sense of. But ultimately, it's inherent as beings to be able to grow, to improve, and to heal, even when we face the unfaceable. It seems that there's just so much that we're being bombarded with. That's why your book is so important. And it has me thinking. So how important is it that we share our vulnerability with others? One thing I've been encouraged by, you know, there's so many thought leaders really speaking about, again, their dual narratives, which is a fancy way of saying the two sides of our stories, our shared stories. So I think we've seen many examples of people who are being courageous to open up and to be more candid and vulnerable. And what we know is that this can have a beautiful impact on our societies across the world, that when we can discover our shared humanity, when we can discover that many of us are flooded with tremendous anxiety and that there is this inherent struggle that we can feel less alone. And, and Mary, and I'm sure, you know, as we've all seen the, the st- statistics and the data on loneliness, you know, now it's being called the new health risk of today, for example, and it's becoming like its own epidemic. And I think it's very telling because Loneliness often comes when we feel disenfranchised, when we feel disengaged, when we feel like no one will really understand our true self, um, when we feel like we're going to be criticized. And so I think when any of us in any role we have, you know, any level of influence we have in the world are more candid and more open and honest, it can be very liberating for those that we influence. And I think that that can be the birthplace of beautiful friendship. I think that can be the birthplace of renewed work cultures where people feel a deeper level of psychological safety. And I think just across society, if we don't feel like we have to play pretend and curate ourselves and always look good on social media or act like we know exactly what we're doing at every given moment or we have all the answers. I think when we can show the true sides of ourselves, that that can be very pivotal um, for someone else witnessing that, and that can help to set them free, um, you know, from maybe the loneliness they feel or the sense of um, no one would get it, or I'm struggling and I don't want anyone to know. And I think for any of us that have gone through difficulties with our mental health, it was probably, you know, us getting treatment or getting help or support or coming to terms with it probably came within the safety of disclosure. I know that was true for myself. You know, the first time someone noticed that I wasn't okay and they asked me, that was like a beautiful domino effect. It was like once that 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 happened and I could come to terms with the struggle, then I could get the help that I needed. And so that's why I think the more we can open up in these hard conversations, the the better off we can all be because we know that it is very much a proportionate reaction to trauma, to suffer. And again, it's not a moral failing. It's not a low IQ. It's not that we're not working hard enough or sometimes even um, 
in spiritual communities, there can be pressure like to kind of have all the right answers or like, or I feel like sometimes there can be this shaming that goes on. Like you're not trying hard enough. You're not praying hard enough. You're not following the practices hard enough. And I think that that can compound that inner struggle, um, that turmoil we feel when we're just not feeling ourselves and we're not feeling well. And your book works in so many different areas of our life. I think it's, um, you know, more, more or less the life lessons we never arrived with, you know, it's showing us what, we, <laughs> how we can work through these things because it's, no one gave us a, a book on how to navigate anxiety when times are tough. Indeed. No. And I think it's, it's, I think it's a hallmark of, you know, after spending so much time working as a psychotherapist and now as an educator and researcher and working with organizations around the world on positive mental health culture and behavior change, I think that it just taught me a lot. And it's given me like a pretty expansive repertoire of skills and, and good science that can be applied and good wisdom that can be applied. And so, you know, that educator, that clinician in me, um, that storyteller in me, I want to bring to light a lot of information, especially at this moment in time, because I think finding a therapist right now is, is like finding a wrinkle on Kim Kardashian. <laughs> you know, it's, it's finding help and getting help. Like, n- never mind just coming to terms that many of us need help, right? It's actually finding that right fit. Um, and I, I'm, I, you know, I, I use humor a lot to bring levity. I don't, I don't think that, that that's a joke, obviously. But I think that having said that, it's, it's a lot to maneuver and, and find our way through. And so um, I, I believe that words are very powerful in the world. I think that we're seeing um, people be very cavalier, especially um, on so-called leadership levels. Like, you know, just saying, we could say it's like the trolls on social media that are really mean to people. Or we could say it's people in positions of power, you know, just like being very loose with what they say and, and, and not demonstrating integrity and ethics. So to me, as, um, as a thinker, I I feel like, you know, what, that, that words can have such an impact. And I think as a therapist as well, I've seen the power of bibliotherapy, um, you know, which is, you know, reading, um, and learning, you know, getting psychoeducation and learning these concepts so that we can apply them in our lives is, is essential. And so uh, I take a lot of delight. Um, I also see myself very much as an artist. Um, and I think, you know, that's something it, writing for me is very therapeutic, especially knowing that the, the goal for me is, is to help influence um, people's lives and, and to improve society and to foster so there's a lot there for sure. Um, I write with a lot of fervor and I write with a lot of um, these personal experiences as well that um, I know how powerful um, books have been to me and, and learning and all the access to knowledge that I've had. And I want to share that with the world. Well, I'm so glad you are. I mean, your background and I just love the science that you bring to this discussion I feel like a lot of times, while there may be facts, it, uh, there's not a lot that backs it up. And so it's nice to have someone that can really talk about the science that is in you know, relation to all of this. Oh, I'm obsessed with it, Marianne. I think that um, anyone that knows me knows that I have a deep aversion to pop psychology and feel good stuff. I mean, it's like hashtag motivational Monday, hashtag self love, hashtag live your best life. <laughs> Everywhere we turn, there's a lot of, I think, well intended messaging around self care. And what I always like to say in my work is that self care isn't superficial. It's not just feel good stuff. It's it's deeper than that. And there's a lot of science that shows that. What, what they call micro breaks or micro rituals or these these behavioral practices that we institute in our lives can actually bring about a lot of healing and positive momentum. And so I, I love it too. I'm obsessed with all of, of what's emerging that shows us that, you know, as Lisa Feldman Barrett talks about in her work, that we're not at the mercy of our emotions. And 
we don't need to, uh, again, live in a space like as if we're operating 40 years ago. We have new knowledge to integrate into our understanding of ourselves and one another. And so I think um, these discoveries, I, I, I believe so much in sharing them because there is a lot of erroneous information. There's so much, you know, that's like, you know, do these three easy steps or this is all about you and cut out the toxic people in your life. And right, it goes on and on. And I think uh, it might be well-intended, but I think we could miss an opportunity to actually really see the things that can help us to stay and do well. I really dive into that deeper work that um, I feel that, I mean, it's, it seems like these situations, when we talk about anxiety, they take years to develop. I would, I would assume that it also takes quite a bit of time to do the work to work through that. Indeed. And so to that point, they say that the onset of symptoms, you know, from the time of onset of symptoms to treatment can sometimes be between eight and 10 years. And so it's true that while sometimes we might have that panic attack moment or, you know, it becomes very clear where we're anxious, it can, it can develop over time. And then similarly to your point, it can take time to be able to look at it carefully and evaluate possible change. Having said that, there is a, a caveat, which is this, that in our world, you know, kind of like America runs on coffee mindset. Um, we see busyness as like a sign of, you know, success. There are a lot of things that immediately can help mitigate anxiety and lessen our experience with that. So, and they're very simple, but it's, they're easy also to overlook or to have trouble changing. And that's why so much of my book and my work is focused on, when I say microdosing bravery, what I mean is we have to look at the small things we can chip away at in our life. So one version of microdosing bravery is evaluating and assessing and having an honest look at ourselves and saying, what could I chip away at and what needs to change? So when we think about anxiety, for example, so much research is showing the importance of sleep on our well-being. Um, it's also showing the importance of time in nature and lifestyle medicine, like exercise and uh, fresh air and, and breathing and meditation and mindfulness practices. So there are a lot of things um, that can really help. And, you know, like to color it in, I remember uh, working with a patient in therapy and they were drinking a lot of coffee. <laughs> like, and so we were talking, you know, about kind of the anxiety at hand and and then, you know, they reduced their coffee and they were already feeling better, like by that one change. So I think we can't get intimidated to think, oh, I, I've suffered for 18 years. That means it's going to take 18 years to get better. I think we can immediately discover some high impact um, things that we can tweak that could actually bring about pretty quick relief. And, and what I will also say is with therapy, I've seen a lot of people come in and within a few sessions, really come to a much better place when they, than when they first walked in the door. So I do think that we can get intimidated by a process of change or feel like it's not going to get better, but that's the anxiety doing the talking, not what much research demonstrates in terms of our capacity to heal and grow. Well, that is very encouraging to hear. So thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Having, having the, those, you know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for those who are suffering from anxiety and, and uh, are able to work through that. You know, in your book, you share about risk and resilience. What is the correlation between the two? Well, I'm so glad you asked because I think, like I talked earlier about the myths of resilience. I think there's a lot of myths about risk. People think that means jumping unabashedly out of a plane or betting it all at the Bellagio or, you know, just being this like big Mufasa kind of person when you actually feel like a cowardly lion underneath it all. So I started to look at risk, um, risks that are strategic, risks that align with our values, that allow us again to become more resilient and to 
face life with greater intentionality and fervor. So for example, let's say I'm a person and let's say I'm in a relationship and I'm having a hard time speaking up. A risk worth taking would be finding the communication, finding the words to share my experience in hopes that that relationship can get better. Um, I think we all have become very risk averse especially given the pandemic and all that's transpired, we we can be very afraid. But just like the gold standard of anxiety treatment is exposure therapy, right? It's, It's facing the difficult things a little bit at a time, integrating them, getting more comfortable with the uncomfortable and taking that next dose or that next bite. And so risks, you know, there's a lot of hype about risks or like, you know, just, pressure, I think, to to think we have to go big or stay home. The kinds of risks I'm discussing here are the ones that can help us to free ourselves from the things that are hindering our progress. And then to be able to, again, give positively, contribute, contribute well in the world. And I think that just living nowadays is a risk. Like everything feels very fear-based and very provocative. And Again, this all, you know, took place um, when the pandemic, all this writing and and research and looking at all these things came um, at a moment in human history that's been very difficult for all of us. And I really want to encourage people. I think this recovery process and trying to figure out what the new world is going to be and what, you know, what we can do and what our place is in it, that alone takes a lot of courage to face. And then for all of us in our own lives, with our own respective variables. There's a lot of ways that we can take many risks, you know, microdose risk in order to build our resilience, to live out our values in the world. Because research shows that if we're living a values aligned life, we're more apt to be resilient, that that indeed is a protective factor towards our well being. It seems that people really strive for this, you know, balance of having safety. So how do we balance that need of safety with taking a risk? Well, it's like anything. I mean, I wouldn't ask someone to like not warm up before a run. Like you're more apt to injure your muscles. So I think that's the whole idea is how do you take risks that stretch you enough without creating injury, right? And so I think it starts, the drawing board is determining um, what your values are and in this assertion of psychological agency, the ability for all of us to determine, you know, these are my values. This is what I want from life and I want to give to life. And so for example, let's say you're a person that wants to travel, but you're you're just so afraid, right? Given everything at hand, how do you begin to maybe unpack that or, you know, maybe take small trips or like just start on a small level and integrate that courage over time. So, you know, it's, it's a process like building resilience and, and facing things that are provocative take time. And, and I think that's the key thing for us to all remember when we're feeling provoked or overwhelmed or overstimulated, that it's a process worth endeavoring because the alternative is, you know, like, let's say, for example, I, to take it back to another running me- metaphor, I'm afraid to go on the treadmill because I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. So if I don't do it, I risk other adverse health reactions, you know, effects to not exercising, right? So like we can't really skirt or escape risk. It's inherent as being humans. It's everywhere we go. You know, some people could think they're playing it safe, like, okay, well, I'm going to take all these measures to keep myself safe. A lot of times that can be a false sense of protection um, and it can really prevent us from living life more wholly and fully. You know, I will tell you, Marian, I don't judge anyone. um, But what I will say is when I see like reports of people saying, well, I'm just not going to leave home. I'm going to build a better home theater or I'm going to avoid like all these situations, like all the way, like, ate a while, avoid everything except for Z, right? And it's like, I think we just can end up 
really missing a fuller human experience. And I don't think we want to live with those regrets, that sense of, you know, missing things, experiences that could grow us. You know, like another great example would be speaking, you know, um, so many of us have that fear, that those initial anxiety moments in the bathroom before a talk. And then, you know, over time with practice, just like anything that's provocative, you learn to integrate that into your experience and use the use stress of the anxiety, you know, for performance and to do well. So I think a lot of times when things are scary, our human tendency is to avoid, but avoiding difficulty doesn't make life less difficult. In fact, it could just mean we're missing out on growth and an ability to enjoy life and to be present with life and contribute positively towards it. It just kind of compounds everything, you know, with having Mm. that disconnect and that isolation, because that's definitely not good. No. And again, I don't think any of us should judge ourselves. I think it's a very proportionate reaction to be scared right now and to we've marinated in so much trauma and fear for so long. Right. And so if we're feeling a certain way, it's not a failing on our part. It's just being able to say, I don't want to stay stuck. So a way I could put it would be, it's okay not to be okay, but you don't have to stay stuck with that. You don't have to stay in a place of trepidation and fear. Instead, you can take tiny steps to renegotiate those fears and to figure out what does a life of meaning look like for me and how do I stretch myself a little bit at a time so then I can see that cumulative effect of those stretches. So just like stress piles up and, you know, the trauma after trauma on trauma and just difficulties and the scary things that all add up in our mind's eye and it can just give us like that constant stomach churn. In a similar way, the microdoses of courage and these actions we take towards facing fear, those also have a cumulative effect on our well-being, right? So on one hand, stuff can be erosive. On the other hand, we can take those tiny steps. And, And I feel like with everyone I speak with, I think the predominant sentiment is I, I feel like I need six months in the woods or like I need like this long Zen retreat or I need like a two year sabbatical. I mean, look at we're facing the great resignation. Recently, the term quiet quitting has exploded on social media. Right. So there's like a lot like a lot of us who are just struggling to still stay in the game, so to speak. And it can feel like, oh, I need to, you know, do this big thing to undo or offset what is at hand. But again, that's probably not realistic. And if we want to stay, whether it's stay working or stay engaged in our lives and our relationships and be able to be there for ourselves and for one another, we really have to be very strategic about what we're devoting our attention towards so that we're not in a position of just like all or nothing. Like it's either I've got to take this big break or, you know, nothing's going to be able to offset that to recognizing that healing is a long process and it's one worth investing in. Do you feel that that all or nothing mentality tends to get people very scared? And so they just would rather bottle up than even try to start something? Indeed. I think especially when we're facing the kinds of challenges of today, it can be very easy to feel paralyzed and uncertain and just kind of shut down. You know this too. I mean, one of the main features of trauma is disassociation and disconnection. And so ultimately, I think we just have to, again, be willing to chip away, even if it's tiny, if it feels minuscule and like, oh, well, what good is this going to do? It's worth trying. Um, And I think that being intimidated by these, again, like there's a lot of pressure out there. I think that noise can be unhelpful. And I think it's also an illusion because it's not what science supports in terms of behavior change. And I don't think that it's also the reality or the truth. Like if people kind of come out and say like, you know, oh, I'm so motivated or I'm doing well, a lot of times that can be a facade and that can intimidate us and scare us away 
from the kinds of actions that could be beneficial towards our lives. In your book, you talk about snowflakes. What are some of the myths around (laughs) that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's so much bickering with the generations and I'm really fascinated by, you know, the discourse or maybe lack of discourse and, and, you know, sort of the perceptions and a lot of people, you know, say things like, look at the snowflakes of today, you know, they're babies. And, you know, there's a lot of that kind of, again, sentiment around, you know, just be tougher or suck it up. Um, One of my sessions, as you know, is called You Are Not a Snowflake. And in it, I talk about, again, these myths of resilience and, how we really need to look at our global context to understand ourselves. So what we know, if we're looking to become more resilient or change our behavior or improve, what we do know is that shaming people or disparaging them or focusing on what we see as a deficit is rarely a marker of positive behavior change. And that kind of bashing or decontextualization of people, you know, any, any age range, but just looking at someone and like making a judgment or being harsh, um, that rarely prompts the kind of behavior change we need. And I think, you know, it's sort of that classic thing, oh, well, this generation, they don't want to do this. They don't want to work or, you know, and I think we need to look across each generation at the, at the, the realities and the difficulties, you know, across human history that generations have faced. And the variables have been different, um, but, but difficult. And I think, um, I thought about this a lot in writing. I was thinking of my grandmother. So she survived the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And her dad passed away. She was nine years old. She and her siblings had to quit school and go to work. And I used to ask her, um, like, did they talk to you about it, grandma? Like, did anyone process your grief? And she was like, what? (laughs) What are you talking about? We just kind of like, no one talked about it, right? And I thought about her a lot as I wrote this book. Um, She lived to 103. She was such a a strong influence on our whole family ecosystem, like such a picture of resilience. And I I, kind of like thought about her a lot for strength throughout it. But I just also think, you know, it's like you can't compare the times, you know, like they didn't have social media constantly telling them how wrong the world is and how bad things are constantly, right? And then they also didn't have access to therapy like we did, right? So we could kind of like do this comparative analysis, but ultimately every generation has faced a lot of difficulties. And I think that just blaming people or um, looking at them in a myopic way isn't helpful. So I really encourage people to think about um, a way that you can own your indomitable spirit and recognize that you are resilient and that there's ways to grow it. And if you have a lot of um, negative feedback, people kind of finger pointing or blaming or shaming you, it's worth kind of stepping away and, you know, seeing like if there's new places you can participate, people, relationships, that can help you discover your strengths and your resources and your assets and help you build that resilience. Because again, it's something that we're all wired to find and to build over time. What are some of the, I know in your book, you talk about validating loops. How does that promote healing? How does that work? Val- this, this is a really, what a brilliant segue question, Marianne. I think it's a, it's a really important consideration. And I've just spoken about the issues with shaming and blaming and In my chapter, You Are Not Your Trauma, I talk about the importance of validation loops in communication. And so this is, for all of us, we can work to adopt a non-judgmental stance towards ourselves and one another. So with ourselves, it could be a lot of us will like should and must ourselves or like feel like, oh, I shouldn't feel this way or um, I'm just not being strong enough. Or maybe I could talk to you about a difficulty I went through and then you could just say, well, it's not that bad or, oh yeah, I had the same experience or at least this didn't happen to you. And that can be very invalidating. So a validation 
you know, if we're trying to take a validation lens and, and really support one another, we can use statements that um, acknowledge the difficulties of our experiences. And instead of just like demeaning them or judging them and saying, oh, it wasn't that bad, um, you know, that didn't happen, that can actually com- compound trauma and make it worse. And so being able to appreciate the fact that experiences happen to us that are very damaging and hard can be a beginning point of healing. Well, thank you for going over that. I mean, there's so much in your book that I have really, truly appreciated. And I think I have time for one more question here. When you were doing all the research for this book, it's so well you know, compiled, everything's very well brought together. Was there something that you found very interesting that maybe most people don't know? Well, one of the pieces of research that I highlighted was Lisa Feldman Barrett's work on not being subject to our emotions and, you know, not being our automated thoughts. And I think, you know, I start session one talking about you are not your fear. And then I go into you are not your automations. And I think that that is a really important thing is that a lot of times we can feel at the mercy of the darkness of the difficulties we face. But yet again, we are wired in a way where we can see those emotions as thought patterns, as, you know, patterns of the brain, like sensing how we're supposed to feel at a given moment. And if we take that time to nourish ourselves and to practice lifestyle medicine and and tend to our well-being, that that can make a big difference. So I think that was one piece of research. And then just finally, a story that really inspired me. Um, I started the book um, talking about Miss Pat, Patricia Williams, who is a comedian. And she is a, a woman of color who grew up in Atlanta in very difficult circumstances. Um, it would be an understatement to say she went through trauma. And then she took to performing arts into comedy. And she really encouraged, encourages people in her work to be brave and tell their stories. And that left such an impression on me. Um, you know, seeing her translate the challenge she's gone to in such a powerful way that affects society um, was very inspirational to me. And so I really want to just, that's what I started the book because I think she really embodies courage and she didn't just get up on stage and tell everything like just magically out of thin air. She started very slowly to get comfortable with the disclosure and with the performance and, you know, to be able to come to terms with what she had experienced and then use that for positive contribution in the world. And I think that's one that's worth checking out for people um, to learn more about her and, you know, the ways that we all could think about ways we could microdose our own forms of bravery to get more comfortable with ourselves and, you know, to to bring forth our our talents and our skills and, you know, our love really in the world. Um, But that's really important that people, you know, take, have as a takeaway. What do you, what thoughts would you like to leave our listeners with today? Well, I would say, take a look at the session chapters. I would, I would say you are not your fear. You are not your keg stands. You are not your automations. You are not a snowflake. You are not your trauma. You are not the likes on your feed. You are not your accomplishments. You are not your label. You are not unguided. You are not alone. You are not like anyone else. You are not a passive bystander and you are not a prisoner. Well, I love that, Dr. Chris. Where can our listeners connect with you and be part of your community and learn more about this book and the other books you've written? They can find me online at kristenlee.com and at the real Dr. Chris on social media. Well, Dr. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. It was such a pleasure, Marian. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you, Dr. Kristen Lee. It has been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about your new book, Worth the Risk, How to Microdose Bravery to Grow Resilience, Connect More, and Offer Yourself to the World. Worth the Risk is available to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. And if you don't see it on the shelf, 
ask for them to order it. And of course, remember to support our indie bookstores. To learn more about Dr. Lee, visit her website at kristenlee.com. Make sure to sign up for her newsletter and be part of her community. There you can learn about her books, talks, and upcoming events. We'd also like to thank Dr. Kristen Lee's publisher, Sounds True. At Sounds True, they believe the inner work we do helps us to develop the capacity to pour ourselves out for others. Visit SoundsTrue.com to learn about this book and all their other great books. And make sure to visit the Moments with Marianne book club at MomentsWithMarianne.com. We look forward to your suggestions and comments about the books and guests we've had. I'd like to thank Jason Eastwood at Guitarfulness for sharing his inspiring music and talent with us. His music is known worldwide for cultivating atmospheres of harmony, inner peace, and clarity. Visit Jason's website at guitarfulness.com. Join his newsletter, be part of his community, and download his music. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne, where we make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmarianne.com for more information.